Hi, welcome to Overlooked. My name is Pooja Advani. My guest today is an award-winning wildlife photographer who believes photography is just not an art, but a piercing language that has no bounds. He is Jayant Sharma. Hi, Jayant. Hi. Welcome, welcome to Overlooked. My pleasure. Uh, Jayant, not many people know that you actually started out with the IT industry and then made this bold move to wildlife photography. Right. Can you tell me one, why did you take this move? And sure. secondly, what were the challenges you faced when sure. you decided to do it? Sure, sure. So just to give you a background, mm -hmm. I was born to a photographer. My dad is a photographer. Uh, I was born and brought up in a studio. I played hide and seek in the dark room. Uh, so. The, the dark room and the photography world naturally was not a curious one for me because it was at home. So while I grew up and I became a teenager and I went into my 20s, I never dreamt I would uh, be interested in photography as a career. But you went into IT, which is exactly. actually very surprising, right? Exactly. So what was important was there was a foundation of artistry in the house. Right. My dad's an artist. We were into music. I was into painting, dramatics. And all of this, I remember, I would uh, be more happy if I won the first prize in singing or drawing or fancy dress competition. I would never fret or worry when I had uh, the 70s or 80s, uh, mm. not wanting to get the ranks in the school. Because for me, it was a holistic, uh, you know, uh, learning, which I wanted to, uh, you know, also thankfully, my parents were very pro, um, you know, uh, extracurriculum. So right. I was born and brought up in that environment where studies were not the only things. Mm. <clears throat> so I... Uh, ended up in the IT industry as a graphic designer, as a user experience designer. Okay. And I was really happy doing what I was doing. I was creating art on the computer and I was reliving uh, all that I had learned in my childhood years. But uh, somewhere in my early 20s, I started traveling out on weekends. Um, you know, when I was in the IT industry, uh, or when I joined in the IT industry, it was early 2000s, 2003, 2004. Uh, a weekend meant only a Sunday. Now I started living a weekend which was Saturday and Sunday. It was mm. a huge amount of time I had. So for a creative person like me, I had to uh, channel my energies right. into some place where I use it properly. Otherwise, I would not, not know what to do. So I started traveling to the national parks. Uh, I come from Mysore. So mm. Bandipur, Nagarahole. These are the national parks which are about 80, 90 miles away from mm. home. So I started traveling to these places and I naturally started realizing my true love, which is nature. Photography is actually not my passion. I, I am very, very frank about it. Uh, photography is my tool. My right. passion is nature. My passion is wildlife. So when I started realizing my love for nature, I realized, hey, I have something at home, which is a fantastic tool that I can use to express my love for nature. And I went to my dad and I said, now I want to take pictures of something I really love. And back in those days, 2001, 2002, digital photography was still not very, very right. easy. In fact, there was no DSLR in the yes. market at all. So I would borrow the film camera from our studio, which was a commercial studio, and I would get a ration of about seven to eight frames, hmm. which my dad had told my, uh, his assistant that you can let this guy go and fire those shots and make mistakes and learn because it was film roll. So I started using the camera only to express what I was going through in the wilderness. Okay. So I would go on weekends. There was the, there's a bird sanctuary called Rangantittu, very close to Mysore. So I would go on a Saturday morning, on a Sunday morning, Saturday evening, try to take pictures of birds, crocodiles, and all of these animals there, and learn from nature. And I had already got um, involved in nature so much that you know, uh, photography was just an extension of my mm. passion. So even today, um, if there's an opportunity where, if, let's say you ask me, you can make a great shot or you can enjoy this ultimate scene, I would not choose the shot because uh, I think I'm a nature lover first, right. and photography comes next to me. But of course, um, anything I do, I try to do it with, um, you know, some kind of passion. So I uh, indulged in photography so passionately back then because it was in the wilderness that I also had the first mover advantage in 2004, 5, 6, you would hardly find a wildlife photographer in your town. You would right. only find them in US or UK, Nat Geo or BBC kind of places. So, because of the first mover advantage, I think I got noticed quickly. Within no time, I was uh, featured on the cover of Sanctuary Asia magazine. Yes. In fact, uh, Bitu Sahigal was uh, one of the uh, uh, people who uh, honed me as a wildlife photographer. He, he gave me a platform to mm. be published. I had my, um, uh, I remember my monitor lizards fighting image was on the cover of Sanctuary. Yes. 
So that was, I think, the, the delimiter of my mind wanting to do this more than what I used to do as a weekend warrior. So I also won an award that year in the Sanctuary Awards. Uh, interestingly, in 2007, out of six covers of Sanctuary, four were mine. So that yeah. was like, if that year was not the year for me to get out of IT and do something like this, there wouldn't be any other year. So I, it was not a planned move. I mm. didn't strategize. I didn't plan. I was in my mid-20s. It was an audacious, stupid decision I took on a weekend. <laughs> um, and I went and shocked my parents who were so proud of me being in Accenture and right. multinational company and IT and all that things. And they realized uh, I had taken a decision. I didn't even ask them that I want to do this. I had quit and I went home. Uh, I told them that I'm serving my notice period in the IT industry and I told them, don't worry, give me a year's time. Um, if it doesn't work out, I can always go back to a job. But back in my mind, I didn't think that was an option at all uh, because I knew something or the other would happen. So that was how I started uh, getting out of IT. And uh, But one thing I want to really mention, because I'm sure there are a lot of youngsters who mm. are in IT might watch this. I didn't quit IT because I didn't like it like many of them. I right. still love IT. I, in fact, write code every day. I run my own company's site. I, I program my website. I create user experience designs for my site. I had to choose between the two passions, not because one was not nice. One was more stronger in my heart than the other. But I still do IT every day of my life. Something just basically drew you towards it. And like you just pointed out saying that nature was something and you use photography as a tool to be in your nature. Right, right. Um, coming down to like, like we're talking to uh, young wildlife photographers that who probably want to take this as an option or a career. Uh, and most of them, I guess, would be thinking, how are they going to, how do we become a wildlife photographer? What would be the guiding points for them? Sure. So uh, if you understand, when you say a doctor or right. you say an engineer or you say a mechanic, or for that matter, you say an architect. There's no hobby engineer. There's no hobby architect. There's no hobby doctor. Yes. There's no hobby doctor. Or you know, But in the world of photography, it's very interesting. When you say wildlife photographer, it doesn't mean the person makes a living out of doing that. It means a person takes pictures of wildlife. So I would really want youngsters to realize being a wildlife photographer is damn easy. Being a wildlife photographer who makes money out of doing wildlife photography is almost impossible. So, right. so I, would, I would say people need to keep goals of wanting to indulge in wildlife photography and that will be met very easily. But I feel a lot of youngsters create an undue pressure in their minds and lives by saying they want to quit doing what they're doing to become a professional wildlife photographer. And I feel they are very naive when they, when they say they want to do that. Because if you ask them, how many people you know in your house has ever purchased a photograph? The answer would be zero. So if nobody they knows has purchased a photograph, who on earth is buying photographs? So then it's basically NGOs, basically magazines, um, and these kind of people who want photographs. I'm not saying they buy photographs. I'm saying they want photographs. And the magazines, you know, in this world of digital, you know, uh, transformation, hardly can afford to buy photographs like before. So they are now featuring photographs of hobby photographers. And they'll say, let's say you are a very good hobby photographer. They'll write to you and say, Pooja, can I publish this elephant, your photograph in Corbett? Mm. I'll give you credits. And let's say Pooja is a software um, or an IT um, uh, professional. Um, she would be happy to get her name in the magazine right. and not really want any money for that photograph. So in this world of wildlife photography today, there is a huge supply of wildlife photographers and almost no demand for wildlife photographs. Uh, there is a need for wildlife photographs. There is no demand for wildlife photographs. But why do you think there's no demand? Because there's so much of supply. You name an animal, name a place, I'll get you a photograph in five minutes for free. So why would anybody pay giant money to buy the photograph? That's right. because the Facebooks, the Instagrams of the world are loaded with these photographs because there is umpteen number of hobby photographers who produce a product which is reducing the demand and the supply is increasing. So magazines don't need to pay anymore. And of course, right. they can't afford to pay as well uh, because magazines are also running on ads and you know right. donations exactly. and things like that. So the market of wildlife photography is, um, you know, what I can, I can summarize it this way. There are 
I mean, I'm just giving you some approximate numbers. Right. I feel there are about 2% of the wildlife photographers who make 98% of the money. That's how I, I look at wildlife photography as a market. The rest of the 98% of photographers do it as a hobby and they should do it as a hobby because when you do something without any um, return on investment interest, you do it with passion. You do it with a great, uh, you know, uh, you get up in the morning because, you know, um, just to give you an example, if somebody is asked to get up and go to office tomorrow, which is a Sunday, let's say, they wouldn't do that if they are really not passionate about that. True. So, if people do wildlife photography as a hobby, out of passion, they are going to most likely do it with a lot of interest and that's also perhaps what wildlife needs today. If you think about it, the world of wildlife and the, and the, and the national park and the environment and all of that don't need professional wildlife photographers. They need ambassadors of nature who hmm. don't do it for um, you know uh, as a profession because they want something out of it but they want to give back something to the world of nature and things that they love so I think as a career I don't see many people making it their livelihood um, most of the people who are doing it have an alternate source of income some of them are into real estate some are, some of them do it as a hobby some of them are, uh, are investors stockbrokers who have spare time and of course the money to do it. I think wildlife photography is like golf. Um, you do it over a Sunday morning. And, and the very well to do can only do it yeah. all the time. Otherwise, um, the, the, there is a class in India which wants to do it but right. cannot afford to do it. I feel they are the ones who are suffering the most. Hmm. There are a lot of ways in which they can also indulge in their passion. They need not aspire to go to Corbett. They can go to Big One in Pune or they can go to you know, what's the place in uh, Mumbai where Savdi or something where mm. you get flamingos. You can do wildlife photography in places like these. But the moment these youngsters put the pressure of making it their livelihood, they not just create an extra pressure and not enjoy doing it anymore. But I think it's not possible to do it as well. No, just simple thing, if I have to ask you, there's supposedly there's a young gent who loves nature mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. has this option that mm -hmm. he wants to take. Mm -hmm. And how would you actually encourage him then? Sure. Uh, in terms of saying, hey, uh, I did it, but I took this route. And uh, I mean, this, what you just said, becomes extremely discouraging for him. Sure, because he absolutely. will be like, but I love nature and I'm now choosing between two sure. passions. Sure. So then what does he do? So, so He uh, or she, yeah. One of my nature is to be candid and really honest. Yes. So when I teach photography to people, they come and say, I want to learn wildlife photography. I love your work. And in the middle of the class, they'll realize all these things that I tell. And they ask me, but, uh, but I am getting a little, you know, um, delusion. I don't know what's right. So I tell them, okay, let, let's ask ourselves this question. So today is a weekend and I'm teaching you people today how to take the best pictures of tigers or polar bears or whatnot. If you were giant and you had the option to stand in front of a polar bear today for eight hours and make pictures of the polar bears hunting or mating or doing whatnot versus going into a banquet hall in Mumbai and doing a course in wildlife photography, what would you do? And 99.99% of the people will say, I would go to the polar bear, right? Then why am I standing here in front of you and teaching you photography? So the truth is, even a giant cannot stand in front of the polar bear 30 days a month. I right. need the 15 days a month in front of people who want to learn photography. So here's the truth about my story. Very early in my wildlife photography career, I realized I wouldn't make a living selling photos. That was the truth. And, and that's a very harsh truth. Yeah, right? harsh truth and practical people bite it faster and realize the next thing. Uh, otherwise, emotionally, if you just want to do something which is not possible, you will fail. So, not that I am I'm successful, I am still trying. But what I realized was surely not the route I need to take was depending on selling photos to make a living. It was absolutely not possible. I can, I can assure you it is not possible for even 10 people in this country. What I realized was I can teach people how to take pictures and because I was a good photographer, I realized uh, I will actually show people how to take pictures and that is what made me get into this as a profession. I don't go to the field 30 days a month trying to make stories for a magazine. In fact, I don't know anybody who does that all the time. So you need to wrap your passion with something else with the, which is you know, uh, money making, revenue Sustainable. generating. Exactly. Because if you, if you think about it, who, want, who can afford to pay you to go to the Arctic and spend 365 days a year? So you have to, there's this funny Instagram infographic uh, that I keep seeing. Um, 
people think in a photographer's life or in a, in a, in a month, they spend 75% of the time clicking pictures, 15% of the time editing it, then maybe 15% of the time selling marketing. So the truth is the opposite. They spend 15% of the time on the field, they spend 15% of the time editing it and making stories or whatever. 75% of the time is finding work, right? So which is the truth. So I think uh, to encourage people who want to do photography, my only urge is why should it be revenue bound? You can do wildlife photography a lot without bringing the pressures of business to it. Because once there is business, revenue, top lines, middle lines and bottom lines, you have a client, you have a deadline, then it is no more, um, you know, uh, the passion which is just there. So it's important for people to realize you can do a lot of wildlife photography as a hobbyist and perhaps that's where you can contribute a lot more than somebody wanting to go and click pictures and selling it and making money. So I think... It's important to realize unless somebody is very well to do, mm. has a lot of spare time, doesn't really expect money out of it, it's a tough uh, business to make money out of. Because going out and doing wildlife photography, as you pointed out, is an expensive affair. Absolutely. absolutely. And, and the only if you have someone to, basically, if you have a client who's ready to buy sure. those off and you're doing it for someone, then sure. it actually makes sense. Sure. Interestingly, just because a lot of photographers might watch this, uh, many people write to me and say, I have five great pictures of tigers, uh, how do I sell it? Now, I, I remember the salesman who would come to our house in the 90s and ring the bell and say, vacuum cleaner, do you want to you know, test? It's very similar to that. So what they have to realize is they should not produce a product and try to find a buyer for it. They should find a buyer and produce a product he or she needs. That's very important in photography. Right. So it, it's like wedding photography. You can't click 50 candid photos and go to a couple and say, you can add this to your album. It'll never work, right? You find a client who wants candid photos of the wedding, then go and make it. So most nature photographers click what they want for pleasure and try to make money out of it, which will never happen. Instead, they have to find somebody who needs a story, find somebody who wants to write about some issue, find somebody who feels there is a need to tell a very interesting, controversial, maybe beautiful story and then go produce pictures for that, there is still a chance of making some money. But just to give you some numbers, if I have to spend 10 days in the Arctic, it might cost plus $10,000. Now, even if I sell all the photos I've shot in those 10 days, I'd not get $10,000. And that is only recovering the investment. What about making money? So I think, I think it's important to realize the truth. As wildlife photographers, um, I'm sure a lot of uh, people would be talking to you about where we are headed now mm -hmm. and uh, in terms of uh, we are losing wildlife very fast right and uh, we're not being able to keep up with it the loss that is happening sure uh, we're losing it to poaching we're losing it to illegal smuggling we're losing it to climate change sure um, and you have traveled very extensively to various right. places um, I just want you to point out maybe there'll be certain things that you probably have seen change in your career span mm -hmm. in various countries that you've actually been to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what would be those changes and aren't those changes probably scary? Sure, absolutely. I mean, uh, one of the most um, interesting areas in this world for me is the Arctic. So, and uh, that is like a mirror to this globe, I feel. You know, on a daily it basis, you can see the reflection is. of what, what's happening to this world. And, and when, when you're sitting in Mumbai, um, you know, you can't realize what's, of course, apart from the floods that Mumbaikers go through, or you know, <laughs> um, we can't realize the, the effect of all of this otherwise. But when you go to the Arctic, and I notice sometimes saying, hey, that glacier was starting from there and till here, two years ago, today it's from here till here, and it's reducing on a yearly basis. So you can see it in your own lifetime. Otherwise, what's happened is so many years of um, you know, creating problems in this world is showing its effect now. Mm. But now in a place like Arctic, you can see it right in front of you. Last year was something else, this year is something else. So it's reducing at that pace. Maybe by the time in our lifetimes, we will not see big changes to uh, where we live. But then, you know, it's, it's going to happen faster if we don't care about it. Uh, but of course, the problem is, what's scary to me is, I don't exactly know uh, how quickly we can do things. Uh, it's, it's a very tough question to answer. There are all these small bits and pieces of things that we need to do as, as residents of this world, which can help uh, conservation in the, in the larger sense. But I don't know how fast these small things can help because the problem is huge. So, right. so a place like Arctic, I can see it in the face. 
every year. So it's every year you see a certain amount of change there. Correct. And Correct. Um, coming down to that, as um, wildlife photographers, mm -hmm. somehow don't you feel it becomes a big responsibility on your shoulders mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you actually are firstly seeing the change uh, right in front of you, firsthand. Right. right. How would you actually tell uh, the photographers that who are going out to do that kind of work that mm -hmm. this is the way that we can actually create an immense amount of awareness? Sure. Uh, to answer your previous question, I had a second part of it as huh. well. So while while what we are seeing around the world is very scary, I must admit we are also seeing a revolution happening all across the globe. You know, uh, I can't think of hundred thousand nature lovers in India fifteen years ago. Today right. there are. Today there are. So what's happening is because there is mass media, social media, which has come up. There's a lot of good information getting passed also. I think in about 10 years from now, uh, I do meet these kids at schools when I do these mm. talks. The amount of awareness they have is 100 times more than what I had as a kid. Of course. And I'm sure going forward, that's the way it will be. And maybe in a few years from now, uh, the newer citizens of this country or the world will be a lot more aware than what I and you were as teenagers or kids maybe. And I think that's the best part of what's happening right now. Of course, uh, we also have a very big bad part of what's happening. Mm. So I think as wildlife photography enthusiasts, um, we, have an, we have a duty, you know, we have a duty. And of course, the duty is not to look at only the revenue and money and other things, but the duty is to project um, a lot of interesting stuff about our world to the larger community. You know, what I feel is, I mean, it's my opinion, it's very personal opinion. Mm. Uh, what I feel is a little bit of a failure of the scientific community is they know a lot of information about this world. They know why is the global warming happening, why is the climate change happening, they know what's the cause of this, methane, that, this and all of that. A lot of science has been understood by the scientific community. But to a large extent, apart from BBC or David Attenborough and things like that, right. a lot is to be done to bring this message to the masses. So that's where it is failed, I feel, because what's the point in some scientists in BNHS learning about mm. why the hornbill died or why the dodo got extinct and things like that. What's the point in some 15 scientists learning about it and keeping it in a bookshelf in BNHS and nobody else knowing about it? The real need today is to bring out already existing knowledge, science, information and spreading it to the masses because it's important for um, everybody to know about some stuff. So I just did a quick uh, dipstick check on my Instagram followers the other day. I, I got somebody to ask me, uh, since you are pretty popular in social media, why don't you run a campaign to plant trees in my state, which is very dry. So I figured he was from Rajasthan. So I realized, wow, it's an interesting question to ask. I went on Instagram and I put a poll and asked people, Rajasthan is a dry desert state. Um, how many of you think we should plant a lot of trees in Rajasthan? I was surprised 70% of the people said yes, while the 30% of the people said no. And I asked them why they said yes or mm. no. Thankfully, the people who said no said that that's the way Rajasthan is supposed to be. It's a desert. There is desert species of trees. There are desert species of wildlife. There's desert species of, you know, uh, amphibians and reptiles and things like that. We cannot plant trees in a place where it's not supposed to have trees. That's but that's the, the fact of it, because these plantation drives mm, that happen, mm, mm. a lot of times they're not actually creating forests. Exactly. Because it is, it is not about the trees that you've actually cut. Right. Yeah, right. Because they have added something to the ecosystem and the biodiversity exactly. that is supposed to be there. Exactly. And I had a guest who explained that to us, saying that you can't do plantation drives because you're going to go out and plant certain trees that you want. Sure. Th this, this brings me to one of the most... Uh, commonly used expressions I, I use for such things. A road to disaster paved with good intentions. Right. You know, there are a million people who want to do good, but since they don't know what is good, they feel whatever they feel is good. Now exactly. this guy, this, this humble, uh, passionate guy in Rajasthan is trolling me saying, why are you not helping plant trees? I plant two trees every day. But the point is, he wants to do something good. So where I feel the scientific community needs to do a lot more, is to teach the science to the common man, not just hold back for the PhDs and the uh, papers and the white papers, because I don't think we need to learn anything more at the moment. We need to do something with what we already know. I think I mean, something action, right? Exactly. That's yeah. what is my non-scientific brain's uh, understanding of all of this. 
uh, I feel since there is a good part of the Rajasthan boy is he's passionate about doing something good. Right. Now it he just needs somebody to channelize his passion and energy and intentions in the right way. Otherwise, he will want to do something good and he'll do whatever he feels is right. Might not be the right thing. So, the wildlife photographers of this world, the first responsibility they have is to realize their role in in this world right. so it's not just to get likes on facebook and instagram uh, that will happen that will happen because anybody who does some good creative work will get followers likes and all that but then if they look at it from a responsibility perspective it might change a little uh, if you ask me what do i do with my wildlife photography i am not a conservationist i don't even know the spelling properly i feel um, i mean i'm kidding i know <laughs> but what what i feel is my role as a wildlife photographer is to create more wildlife enthusiasts, more wildlife photographers. So I feel I am working on the grassroots level where I create more nature loving, passionate people who can empathize with all of this and some of them will grow to do wildlife photography, some of them will go to do conservation photography, some of them might realize, hey, I got into wildlife because of photography, but I think I need to do something else and they'll move on to some serious uh, you know, aspects of their lives. So I feel wildlife photographers need to graduate right now. They are, they are at the Facebook, Instagram level right now. It hmm. needs uh, a lot of thinking to take their photography to a level, not just the artistry level, but also the intention and the reason why they're doing that to a different level. I mean, in terms of when you said that um, there's a lot of um like how the scientific guys need to start sharing knowledge mm -hmm. and start bringing out actual why what is happening, uh, the reasons behind it, what is it that we can probably do to change it. Uh, how do you actually create that awareness? Now, how do you create an awareness mm -hmm. to that Rajasthan boy mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. has good intent mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. does not know how to channel it? Correct, correct. Uh, that's where I think the wildlife photography enthusiast yeah. role is because you right. know, um, he also is a wildlife enthusiast because you know you can understand the scientific community generally likes to work in isolation. Now, I'm not blaming them for not sharing information. It is they are doing hard work. They are toiling in the field and bringing information, giving the world some knowledge. I think non-commercial warriors of nature, these wildlife photographers and enthusiasts should take up that role because they are the ones who will go and show their mom and dad and sister and brother and brother-in-law what's happening to the Arctic. I had one more instance. Somebody sees me posting these polar bear pictures all the time on Instagram and he who questioned me saying, being an Indian photographer, why can't you do something in Sundarbans, the tigers are dying. Why do you have to go to Norway to take pictures of polar bears? Now, he is also very concerned about the tiger. While I got a little upset with the, the uh, maturity of the guy, but I realized, look at his uh, plus side. He's worried about the tiger, but it's only the lack of knowledge that he has that makes him not relate to the glacier in the Arctic, which is affecting the Sundarbans tiger. Right. Like on, only when the glacier in the Arctic is melting, the water levels in Sundarbans is rising because of which his tiger is dying. So when you make these common men and women join the dots uh, of what's happening in this world, they'll realize, also see a lot of us, we Indian people are very patriotic, right? We feel, we <laughs> feel wildlife of India is also like India cricket match. So I feel a lot of people tell me, there is so much wildlife in India. Why do but we need to go is. to the Africa? But there is. There is, correct. But then um, there are areas in this world where bringing stories and connecting to India is also True. important. It's True. not like, you know, what I'm trying to say is somebody says, I don't want to shoot out of India. I will only shoot pictures in India because there's so much wildlife in India. That is okay. That's a great thought. But it need not, need not be because of patriotic reasons. Because, you know, uh, I feel nature doesn't have any boundaries. There's no political boundaries to nature. And the whole world is one. So people should appreciate how in a different country something is happening will affect our wildlife, our country as well. So absolutely why water levels are rising in India and in Mumbai in the coasts and all of that is because of things happening in the Arctic and in the Antarctic region, right? So because of that, the water levels are rising. I think it's very important in terms of people who are working in the field, especially wildlife, climate, environment, conservation. I think it's become very important for us to now link it all together. Correct. You know, it's one planet. Correct. It's one movement. Correct. Every one of us gets affected by 
everything that we do in our own day to day life right so it is not only me doing something that is going to affect my children mm -hmm. me doing something is going to affect your children too right and i think that thinking till right. the time we don't have as a race mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think sure. that's it, it basically like how you pointed out saying that uh, the guy is kind of coming up to you and saying my tigers and sundarbans are dying why are you going and shooting polar bears true, true, but the true. fact of it is because the arctic glacier is melting here absolutely. the water levels are rising here absolutely the moment the guy realizes that his perspective of the world will change exactly it 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 will not be bound by the the state he lives in or the district he lives in or the tiger he has seen and uh, so the problem is the wildlife warriors of this country get down very personal so they would have seen a tiger it happened even in rajasthan a few years ago there was a very popular tiger which was moved because of it hurting some you know it it was a man eater i believe and so people see the tiger they get emotionally attached to it and they want to protect it my tiger the one i have seen i have taken pictures of it they have to look at it from a non individual perspective from a species perspective from a global perspective from not just this tiger was mating with that female it owned this area perspective which is very narrow minded uh, they have to look at it from the whole animals perspective or the or the national parks perspective or overall perspective rather than individually but i think we are getting there uh, 20 years ago which um, where in the world people would protest about a tiger being killed or about a tiger being moved from a national park to a zoo mm. today people are doing that which mm. means we are slowly getting to that maturity level of what needs to be in this world uh, to conserve it i think uh, it started it started though i think we have a long way to go in terms of like yeah like you're saying uh, but sometimes you feel right the political lobbies is something that you can't really defeat mm -hmm. and you're going into if you actually look at the whole and and you brought this out how the 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 information needs to be shared and then suddenly you look at it in and i had the same question with someone else who was here that You're seeing countries mm -hmm. like Botswana. You're seeing countries like Japan, right? That are pulling out of things that they had actually instigated 30 years ago, right? Yeah, whether culling of elephants in Botswana is sure. concerned, sure. Whale culling in sure. in Japan is when Japan leaves IWC, it was just like Correct. what? Why at this point of time where we at that brink, right? Where we need to actually. put more emphasis on on regulations and and unity Correct. and and you see countries like this mm -hmm. as a wildlife enthusiast right. what is the emotion you probably go through yeah, it's amazing I and mean, i think i think when people the common man gets together the political class has no way to go you know because, because imagine a million people wanting something to be done to a national park let's say a road going through a national park to be stopped or a dam to be not built when a million people get together i think no government can you know oppose it right so that's what is the most important thing right now uh, peer pressure all the countries also are getting into this pressure you might have seen that lion which was killed by a dentist a few years ago cecil yeah cecil the lion and how the whole world reacted yes. right how many years ago was something like that seen this in this world the recent right? was a uh, wood trek wood trekker right the right. elephant bull that got exactly, shot exactly exactly today everybody is caring about it all the countries are making laws of not bringing uh, game animals into their country and they won't allow it to be passing through custom and these are all rules that is evolving they are changing and that's that's good that's happening at a good time and uh, our grassroots level knowledge is increasing the policies are changing overall i think we're headed in the right direction but i wish it happens faster it's already a little too late so that's what the another guest of us said that and uh, the change is there yeah but uh, will the change be fast enough right and right. that's what i think each one of us at some level is fearing sure. that will the change be fast enough to make that impact that we really need to make right right absolutely i mean there there are um, some positive changes that we are seeing because you know you you know the number of tigers in india uh, about 2006 was so bad now it's gone up to almost True. twice the number i remember Uh, there was a ndtv campaign 14 11 was the number of tigers yes. know, every day there was a campaign yes. today it probably doubled and uh, of course it's 50 times less than what it was 100 years ago but the good news is we know what so even in business right the first step to realize we need to correct our problem is to realize there is a problem so now Acceptance. we have realized exactly we have accepted there is a problem same thing happened in sariska right they would deny there's no problem there for a long time until it was proven that there is a problem and once everybody accepted there is a problem there will be solutions and now i think 
I think most of the places there are solutions, but of course we solve a problem somewhere, we create a problem somewhere else and overall when the common man rises to the occasion only then it will happen, otherwise there will be, do you know about the iron ore industry in Karnataka which was stopped because of um, you know um, the common man and the issues yes. and the NGOs fighting for it, now it's stopped right, that was a great move. So we need to see things like that happening across the country and in different countries as well. But one thing I can tell you, with all these trips I do in every part of the world, basic intelligence of wildlife, knowledge of climate, of environment, of, of, of the globe in general is rising at a very, very rapid pace. The common man is learning about species he wouldn't even know of. True. Uh, that is a very good sign. I think we have, we have been doing a very good job of that. And that's actually, I would actually... Uh, um give a lot of credit to social media that has brought the world so closer. Absolutely. absolutely, uh, absolutely. They, they, you're seeing pictures of animals that you probably will never see before. Absolutely. absolutely. And uh, You know, who, yesterday I, I had an ex-colleague called Sophia who, who commented on one of my reindeer pictures seeing, I'm seeing actual reindeer for the first time because she sees it every Christmas on, her, on the cake. But she's seeing an actual reindeer picture for the first time mm. because an Indian friend of hers went to the Arctic and photographed a reindeer. Right. Now that is something which is interesting. It could be just a silly comment on social media, but if you think about it in a different perspective, she has been celebrating Christmas for 35 years, but has never seen even a picture of a reindeer. She thinks it's from it's Santa Claus's uh, you know, um, uh, pet and it's not existing in this world. She knows Santa Claus is not present. She thinks even the reindeer is not present. Now she sees a real photograph of a reindeer which means her thought process has triggered that there is an animal called a reindeer. Right. So that is something which is the grassroots level of awareness of conservation, I feel. That, that, that is something that is happening. That is, and it's happening at a rate that, uh, and the children all, like you said, children also understanding and they're getting aware that they also need to kind of step up right, right. To, and rise up to a certain occasion that probably their parents don't realize. Absolutely, absolutely. And most of the parents are changing the way they live because there's pressure from the kids now. Exactly. The kid says, Mama, don't do this. Papa, don't do this. Don't throw plastic. Don't buy a plastic bottle and things like that is happening in this world. And uh, thankfully, these guys will grow up to be parents in 15 years from now and their children will not even have to be taught because right. they'll learn what's the right thing. Right. And uh, I, I remember what, what I used to do as a kid, which was not at all pro, uh, <laughs> you know, environment, which is now changing in my own life, uh, how, how I look at all these things. Thankfully, it is happening uh, at this uh, juncture and the next generation will definitely be yeah. a good one. Uh, it starts somewhere, no? So exactly. For all of us, it has been a very, learn a very, very um, extensive learning process that's True. happening right now. So, we're reliving, re relearning what we can use, what we can use, can't use, Absolutely. what we should use, what we shouldn't use. Absolutely. Kind of Absolutely. Thing. Now, if you realize, uh, there are seafood restaurants with, right. a, a, with a, a dossier sitting next to the menu, which helps them get a little more aware of what species they should order so that they don't uh, hamper the reproduction of that species. For example, let's say this is a time of the year where I don't know much about fish, I'm a vegetarian, sorry. So there's some species of fish you should not consume in this time of the year right. because they are breeding or whatever for that matter. Okay. Now by not fishing and not consuming you won't get the fish. And because you don't fish during that time for this particular species, you help them to reproduce. Now that's an amazing uh, progress in, you know, it's come to the dining table now, the conservation of... Oh, I never knew that. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. Now there are, there are documents which sit next to the menu card. It says good for this, good to eat this, good to eat that. However delicious it might be, it's the wrong time of the year to consume this species. Right. And some restaurants don't even serve that species because they right. say it is not um, uh, conducive to uh, fish this uh, species right now because it's uh, breeding time and also uh, you don't allow the fish to grow um, to a particular size. You fish them out when they are still young which means they can't reproduce and that's how you… And uh, you're, you're yeah. basically damaging the, the whole food chain. Absolutely. Then. I did a story on the Andaman fishermen. Right. Um, they would go at 3 a.m. in the morning and come back by lunchtime with a big catch. Now they are going for three days. Now they're going for three days. If they leave today, they come back three days later because that's the distance they have to cover to catch fish. So that's a big sign to understand because okay. one of the areas where the world really needs some attention is underwater. Yes. Because we can see the tiger in Corbett and Bandavgarh and Rantambur, we can't see underwater as much. Very little number of Indians are seeing the underwater beautiful world. 
but that is depleting at a very faster pace. So these fishermen to bring the same amount of fish, fill their boats with fish are traveling three days now, which only shows to say that the fish uh, is reducing around the coastal areas. So which is a scary mm -hmm. thought. I mean, I, I know what you're saying because yes, um, being an animal lover, going out to the wild parks and doing all of that, it was always the first, you know what you see, you see a tiger, you see an elephant, you see this. My encounter with um, sea mammals mm. was actually the first time my interest kind of came out was in 2017 mm -hmm. okay. when I actually went to Alaska. I see. And I saw the humpback whales. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. And I saw the orcas. Right. And I saw the orcas hunting. Right. And right. I also saw the humpback whales uh, bubble netting. Okay, wow. And mm -hmm. about seven of them just mm -hmm. came out where we were. Uh, and I had a whole... Uh, there were trained marine biologists who were on our tour. Right. And right. it was this place that you will stay at a distance. You are not allowed to interact with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So... Um, one of those ethical tours that you actually sure. go out and seek for. Sure, sure. And that is when I realized the, how fast the numbers are declining. Absolutely. absolutely. And what is actually happening. Right. Um, right. I saw the orcas of the Vancouver Island. I see, okay. And mm. we saw this entire family mm -hmm, of uh, mm -hmm. seven. So it was like an entire pod of the seven. Pod of seven. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, they were telling us that they had lost about six orcas. Mm -hmm. Of the pod. In, mm. Of the pod. Mm. Of the pod, okay, and okay. purely to starvation. Ah, okay, mm -hmm. and uh, sure, of course, purely of to course. starvation because mm -hmm. these guys come into these waters because mm -hmm. it's warmer during the summers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, from Alaska, right? And um, and these are basically native, so right. these are resident orcas that they call. Sure, and they pointed out that at that area there's mm -hmm. these. Cottages that mm. are actually studying them. Ah, okay. They're watching their movements. Wonderful. Mm. And uh, that was my first encounter with with right. sea mammals. Right. And that's when I realized that yes, we are so focused right now on the right. surface level of exactly. what is above sea level. Exactly. That we completely forget what's going down happening under. To add to your thought, you know, um, the Andaman Islands, of course, right. the, the tsunami changed a lot of it. Uh, right. Big, you know, but irrespective of that, a lot of coral reef has come back to life. Uh, when we dive in the Andaman Islands, um, on, a, on a week long dive, we might see one shark. Now, when you dive in the Maldives, which is not so far away, you'll see sharks every day. Because you, you have to realize Maldives stopped shark, um, you know, uh, fishing or hunting sharks because they realized one shark alive is much more valuable through tourism than hundreds of them being killed. So uh, India um, doesn't have so many sightings of sharks right now. I mean, because mm. that, that means something. That exactly. means something. And Maldives has so many right now. That means something. That means there's, there's no hunting, fishing there. And you see a lot of sharks. It's how many miles down the southern tip of India? It's not too far away not at all, far. but it's full of sharks. It's a lot of, because sharks are, um, you know, you know the shark finning industry, how they were hunted and things like that. So, uh, I think that is something which is a scary story. And talking about wildlife enthusiasts who enjoy the big animals first, I'm sure that's how all of us got into wildlife. I got into wildlife looking at tigers in Bandipur as well. It's just that some of us sustain this journey and we realize over time, uh, while you save uh, uh, the vegetation, the tiger survives. So, right. so that level of maturity will happen over time. At least people should, and that's why you know I feel tiger is paying a price. The tiger is paying a price to help the rest of it by being the mascot. Everybody wants to save the tiger, but we should start looking at it as a representational, um, you know, logo of the world of wildlife. Though the common man will say save tiger, he actually means save the wildlife. So that is what because I think. Because he's the predator, he's on the top of the food chain. Exactly. And, and, and it works, exactly. it's a ripple effect that has to happen all the way down. Exactly. Underwater, I think Mumbai is probably the best city in the country to send people to underwater destinations, to Andamans and Lakshadweep mm. and all, all that. Because there are quite a lot of diving schools in Mumbai who teach people how to dive. Yes. And they are doing a good job. That brings us to a point of why tourism might be adding to um, creating awareness about wildlife conservation. As well. In terms of being such a wildlife enthusiast, you are seeing a lot of, um, of course, there's, there's two sides to everything, right? So you're seeing these conservation efforts that are happening. 
uh, but you're also seeing a rise in uh, man animal conflict mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and where does that leave you in terms of because you you know the, the the thought process that i always have and that's what i've been actually has led me to do this show is that if if we continue to do the ground level work that we are doing um either ways yeah mm -hmm. positive or negative mm -hmm. we won't have wildlife mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sure and does that thought come into your mind sometimes of course of course uh, i mean um it's it's a scary thought it happens all the time the num number of uh, exotic species which are dwindling because of issues are rising so it is it is definitely not impossible you know imagine 1500 tigers uh, it's it's so little for a country of this size that was that was probably the nail uh, uh, in, on the coffin when when we realized we had such a small number of tigers so i'm sure there is some other other animal which is if you actually look at it i'm sorry mm -hmm. to cut you but yeah. but if you actually look at it you're losing 10 to 8 to 12 tigers in 14 days mm -hmm. so right. you you're, you're even looking at those numbers you're looking at uh X number of elephants being and either leopards. Leopards, mm. leopards is like it's every become day. an everyday story, exactly. especially exactly. for a state like Maharashtra. Leopards exactly. has now become oh, a leopard got mauled here, or right. a leopard was in this hospital building. Correct. Uh, Correct. Uh, you know, you're looking at these numbers, which mm. are which are staggering sometimes. Correct. Correct. And I mean, for me, I'm not even in the field. Mm. I'm just still I'm still outside, you right. know, and I'm looking at it from the, a very very uh, different perspective right in terms of oh my god mm -hmm. if this is going to continue mm -hmm. but you are right there at the heart of it right right i think there there are multiple reasons for that one is of course encroachment into uh, national parks and natural areas mm -hmm. which is forcing animals i mean we feel they are coming into the society but actually we have gone to the society as well in some cases also i feel a lot is not seen about the prey density of these places you know um, right. a leopard has to come out of let's say um, what's the national park uh, sanjay gandhi national sanjay gandhi national park to powai or some place like that because there's no probably there's not enough um, prey prey species there they have to come for the dogs they have to come for the wild pigs or the domestic uh, pig so i'm sure the prey species is more important than the predator as well and if you look at a national park where there's enough prey species you it will show that they also have a great amount of uh, predator uh, population as well so that could also be something which people are looking at i'm sure the scientific community has a lot of projects going on to mm. study the spotted deer population or let's say the wild boar population or the sambar population which could be a, a reason why the leopard has to you know get out and mm. also encroachments i'm sure it's not a secret I mean, that we it, are going into the going forest going into that what is your your viewpoint about villagers getting compensation when they get into uh, animal conflict uh, when, when they have livestock man, livestock, livestock conflict that they have or the or the um, animal has come and destroyed their mm -hmm. crop mm -hmm. yeah i mean i'm sure there are uh, all kinds of stories and all sides of the coin i mean in a place like ladakh when a snow leopard kills somebody's yak the person gets compensated in a bandipur a cow is taken by a tiger he gets compensated of course uh, um i mean it's it's a little tricky question i really don't know what's the right thing um of course if you think about it from a villager's perspective he has one animal which he has purchased with you know maybe um, a lot of savings and things like that and he has lost it at the same time there are also villagers who go to the national parks to graze like bandipur gets 50 cows in one part of bandipur and um, also there are these non milking cows that are going into the national parks to produce dung and dung is being sold for organic manure so there are all kinds of you know things happening, happening. in the in the in the surroundings of national parks now and i i have a friend in mysore who did a research and figured out this cow dung which was being purchased was being sold to Uh, the coffee industry far away because brazilian coffee market was going down brazil realized they don't want to produce organic coffee they don't want to use their land which is nature for producing manure so they are buying cow dung from bandipur uh, to produce organic coffee somewhere else and um, or maybe increase the uh, 
you know productivity of the coffee and things like that so it's <laughs> intertwined all over the world it's amazingly confusing to an extent so it's, it's, <laughs> it's sometimes when you actually sit down and 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 open up the whole puzzle box and you're like <laughs> hey bus i cannot do this yeah. anymore in fact his article said if your coffee smells of something you know where it is coming from <laughs> <laughs> that's what he ended the article i remember very well with yeah so, so it's confusing to the core when it comes to uh, the overall wildlife situation and national parks and rules uh, i feel it's not easy to answer that question no i agree because it's it's a very conflicting situation that even i have so mm-hmm. um i've been asking this viewpoint from a lot of people because even i'm said i mean i had someone who said that um the wild life has killed your the 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 villagers livelihood mm-hmm. and that's the only livelihood they have so right. they need that kind of compensation that comes in sure but then i'm going at but the wild life, the cattle did not need to be be, be there mm-hmm. in the first place right right so right. where does that it two sides of the coin true true um, yeah it's a, it's a tough tough question because you know and also know some people who might fake the livestock uh, being hunted thing to get some compensation at the same time there might be some people who would not get compensation because the so the i think the rule is something like this if the tiger goes to the village they get the compensation if the cow goes to the park they don't some some rule like that in some areas So, so so I mean it's bent quite a way I exactly. mean if you look at the case of Avni that happened you do exactly. not know what actually went down Exactly exactly um, it's 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 a tough so question So <laughs> you look at uh, Avni's case or even look at the three tigers that got um, who died recently in Tarova mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. two cubs and Correct mm-hmm. again it, it it's a very gray area that you have Correct correct but the, the I think the forest department has never been uh you know so much in attention like now because now every tiger's death is looked by a million people 10 years ago if some tiger died they might not be questioned so much at all so i'm sure that will make the department you know uh, work on their you know uh, feet and be always alert and things like that so that brings us back to the same question common man's awareness and participation in all of these will be the only thing that is needed that to, is basically so i guess the 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 awareness programs once they start going into the grassroots levels mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and um, as a unit people actually start standing up correct, correct that that actually has been the entire crux of everything i agree i agree hunting i we i just read an article right now where they had done the biggest wildlife bust mm-hmm. about 582 people arrested right some 3000 bird 2000 odd birds Absolutely. and in looking at the scale of it sure and sure. i'm sitting there and i'm like why <laughs> yeah even you know? the, the the guy sansar chand or somebody who was who recently died i heard um he had uh, you know he has been involved in so many poaching cases somebody told me about the 500 leopard skins that were seized in a truck crossing over to nepal right. uh, probably on the way to china maybe i don't know so i mean the amount of uh, maybe that was accumulated over a long time i can't imagine somebody killing 500 leopards in few months but it's definitely happening in different parts of uh, the places but maybe not as rampant as it used to be i mean of course i'm not there in these areas to see it and you know it's, it's just 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 a con- thought process that came in mind because i mean you as a wildlife enthusiast as a photographer are so at the heart of everything that right. actually is happening right um and so in tune mm-hmm. with uh, you know the nature mm-hmm. you you travel so much in terms of visiting the places mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it sometimes must be just heartbreaking sure, to to sure. even i feel it's a personal opinion i'm sure some scientific community with some statistics might might not agree with me uh, i feel poaching is not as big an issue as habitat loss uh, as encroachments i feel because uh, poaching is something which the common man can easily relate to and say how the hell can he kill the leopard or the lion or the elephant what the common man doesn't realize is the very cup of tea we are drinking today is actually at the cost of a leopard's habitat uh, a forest has been cut to start growing tea uh, that is something which is very tough for us to relate to we right. immediately see that somebody killed a leopard and what nonsense how can he kill the leopard that's easy for a common man to relate to what is shocking for us is when we are made aware of the cost of the coffee or the tea that is coming at the cost of a leopard's habitat which is why it is coming from uh, a borivli national park to a powai is a shocking reality which the whole world needs to know uh, that's And when we'll look at it differently that is true actually mm-hmm. uh, in terms of habit i mean of course encroachment and all of that we are we are 
at a pace that we are going. I mean, I mean, you look at look at what's happening here: the coastal road project mm -hmm. and the metro shed mm -hmm. and 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 RA forest. It is a very very frightening space to be in. Sure, sure. Right? I'm sure for the decision makers also, it's uh, not an easy choice. Uh, but you know, it's it's. I think it's the price we are paying for development and all of those things. Uh, we need the roads. We want the want the tolls and the highways and everything. But we also need to protect that. So it's very tough. I don't know how we'll manage it. Uh, I think India's population problem is something which is also a big reason for that. I don't know how we are going to work on that. Uh, but having said that, there's also the scientific community which is saying our footprint, even though we are a billion and a half, is much lesser than even the developed countries which, which are one-tenth of our size in population. They are producing more uh, you know, carbon footprint Potential. than we are doing. So it's amazing that you know it's it's not easy for the decision makers and the uh, you know law uh, uh, makers also because it's it's not easy answers yeah of course <laughs> asti jayant i want you to um, tell me i want a message from you for a young wildlife enthusiast mm -hmm. like like you know someone who's going to watch this what would you your message be to them sure so um, i think being truthful about the intention is important to realize. I got into wildlife not because I wanted to save wildlife. I got into wildlife for the lust of it. I loved nature and loved wildlife. That is something which I think is a very important realization. We cannot save tigers by making sharp photographs of tigers and posting it on Instagram. That's a reality we should have as well. At the same time, by posting good pictures on Instagram, Facebook, by being wildlife ambassadors, nature ambassadors, we would contribute to the larger conservation goal without our, our realization. It's not that we have to go on a census to count pug marks, to count tigers, to promote uh, conservation. Mm. We can do it in our own way by educating our own family about it, our friends about it, our school about it, our college about it, our colleagues about it, uh, and showing them pictures and taking this role, which might not have incentives, but is important right now, taking the role of being um, an unofficial nature ambassador and promoting wildlife and nature to your small followers and fans and then overall we'll before we realize we'll see the whole country is able to resonate to what you're mm. talking about then we will not want to grow trees in Rajasthan we will all know <laughs> that uh, that is the place which is supposed to be like that so I feel the unofficial nature ambassadors role is probably the most important a role to be played in wildlife conservation in India today True. and this community of nature lovers thankfully people who uh, have uh, so much passion to get up at 5 in the morning to go on a safari to see a tiger's tail and come back in the evening again to go and find the tiger those are the people who can save this world today uh, especially with nature wildlife and everything so they should just know what their goal is what their role is and not misunderstand their role for something else don't look at it as a profession there's nothing like that look at it as your moral responsibility as your social responsibility and do it for yourself be selfish about you wanting to see a tiger you wanting to see a leopard and that is the only reason why the leopard will be alive in the future not because you want to do some favor to it that is very true and it's so important for each one of us to <laughs> And it's coming back to the same thing that I said. No, it's my wildlife. It's exactly. my leopard. Exactly. I yeah. want the, my leopard to be seen by everyone. Right. So yeah. I will do everything to protect it. Right. <laughs> it's being selfish in a way. Of course, yes. of yeah. course. If you if you don't love something, you'll not protect it. That's very true. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jan. My pleasure. Thank you so much my for pleasure. taking the time out and coming and talking to us. My pleasure. Thank you.